Hello, it's six o'clock and this is Anglia Tonight. Bringing you the news from Essex, Norfolk and Suffolk. Tonight's top story, a harsh lesson. The head teacher who's improved grades by excluding two pupils a day. But does this mean pupils who cause trouble just become someone else's problem? Also tonight... The mother of a young man killed on our roads tells Anglia tonight why she wants drivers to understand the hurt and heartbreak their actions can bring. The consequences are for other road users, not just yourself. And they can be devastating. Ready for war, the soldiers about to leave for Afghanistan get in some crucial battlefield training. Club for sale. Delia calls in football's Mr Fixit to sell her stake in the Canaries. <laughs> and there's a hero's welcome for the champion Slimmer, who's half the woman she used to be. Hello from Stephen and me. Welcome to the programme. Later on, we'll meet the footballer whose girlfriend is about to begin life in the jungle. But first tonight, the head teacher who's won plaudits for her hard-line approach to bad behaviour. Caroline Haynes, who's the principal at Tendring Technical College at Clacton, insists on good manners, good conduct and a neat and tidy standard of dress from all of her students. Those who break the rules are sent home for a day or a week. It's meant that the number of permanent exclusions at the college for more serious offences has gone down sharply, while exam results have shown an equally dramatic rise. Timothy Evans reports. She's been labelled the strictest head in Britain. Caroline Haynes insists on unfashionably high standards in behaviour, manners and appearance. Suggests to her that tendering technical college is returning to Victorian values and this is her reaction. Good Lord, no. <laughs> no, much better values than that because it's all um, wrapped up in kindness, fairness and fun. We have lots of fun here. On the back of it, you should have the mark scheme that we saw through last lesson. For students, there's a three strikes and you're out rule. Misbehave three times in one lesson and you're excluded from that lesson. Repeat that in another lesson and you're sent home for the day. There are reminders of the rules all around the school at Thought the Soka near Clacton. It's a policy which has resulted in hundreds of exclusions. I spoke to some 13-year-olds to gauge their feelings towards this emphasis on discipline. You get more learning out of it because less people are talking if they're in control, the teachers. Well, most students, I think, are quite happy to be at this school. But they won't distract you in class, they won't disturb your learning, and then you get to learn more. Some just really distract others, so we can't get on with how we want to like, be, and we can't learn. The proportion of children permanently excluded from schools varies across the region. The English average is 12 in every 10,000 students. In Essex, the ratio is slightly higher, 13 in 10,000. The corresponding figure for Norfolk is 10, and for Suffolk, it's 7. The worst figures in the country are significantly higher. Caroline Haynes says the number of permanent exclusions from tendering technical college is a fraction of those from similar secondary schools. Academic results are enviably high. She and her school have the support of their local MP. Um, this is about saying these are the boundaries. If you step over the line, you're going to go and spend a few days at home. And that's a very good, sensible thing. And I, I actually think it's how a school should be run. This school is a comprehensive school for every student and for every type of student. But there is no excuse for behaving in such a way that it causes distress or chaos to other people. Across the country, there are moves to reduce the number of temporary or fixed period exclusions. Education experts say that's for a good reason. There is some research evidence to suggest that pupils who are either permanently excluded or regularly excluded are more likely to drift into getting into trouble with the police uh, to end up being unemployed and unskilled. Excluded students here must complete work at home before returning to the school with their parents. The discipline strategy may be controversial, but it's popular with parents. Many families outside the catchment area are now pressing for their children to be educated here. Timothy Evans, Anglia News, Thorpe Le Soken. And we did approach both Ofsted and the Department of Education, but both declined to give us a comment. 
Well, next tonight, next less than 24 hours after Armistice Day finished, our thoughts once again turn to our region's troops as they prepare to be deployed to the world's danger zones. The Light Dragoons, who are based at Swanton Morley in Norfolk, have been undergoing intensive training with new high-tech equipment before being sent to places like Afghanistan. Rebecca Atherstone went along to meet them. It's the day of the jackal. This vehicle will deliver a new level of power to the soldiers on the ground in Afghanistan. This is Retham Camp, and this week the Light Dragoons, who are based in Swanton Morley, are on exercise here. Some of the Jackal 4x4 patrol vehicles have already been sent to Helmand province, and they're a welcome sight for the forces there. Since 2003, over 30 soldiers have been killed in the less well-armoured Snatch Land Rovers, which had been criticised for insufficient protection against roadside bombs. So are the Jackals replacements? As you say, there has been a lot of uh, talk about, about the snatch, uh, and uh, it's one of those, uh, it's just one of those vehicles that we have in the range to do a variety of tasks. But as new equipment comes in, uh, so uh, potentially the snatch may be moved on to do other things, uh, and other vehicles with enhanced levels of protection may be used. This exercise is just part of intensive training before the soldiers do get deployed to places like Afghanistan. And here they make it as real as it's going to get to try to prepare them for what they might run into once in a war zone. No one knows what to expect here, but the scenarios are copies of what happens. Here, a suicide bomber runs out towards the armoured vehicle. A simulated Taliban attack takes place and the Dragoons have backup. Key fuel and ammunition supplies arrive from the skies. Apache helicopters are called in. It's real decision time, although this time the bullets are blank. Experienced soldiers are training alongside the newcomers and passing on their knowledge. My experience uh, over the last 19 years can be easily passed down um, to improve their basic knowledge uh, from, uh, from training and take it that step further so they know exactly what's coming uh, and what to expect. For troopers who've not long been in the army, that knowledge could prove vital. I haven't been out in theatre before, so, but from what I've been hearing from the guys, they're trying to make it as realistic as possible. Trooper Julian will also learn all about the jackal. Described by some as an incredible piece of kit, it can reach 80 miles an hour road speed, is heavily armed and covers just about any terrain. There will be no hiding place from this vehicle, which packs about as much punch as a tank, and it could also be a lifesaver. Rebecca Atherstone, Anglia News, Retham Camp. Next tonight, a campaign's been launched in Norfolk aimed at making motorists aware of the potential devastation they can cause on the roads. The road safety organisation Brake is demanding safer driving after revealing that 391 people were killed on the roads in our region last year. Well, our reporter Malcolm Robertson is live now at the A47 at Arminghall, which is just south of Norwich for us now. So, uh, Malcolm, tell us a bit more about this campaign. Well, it's a very hard-hitting campaign, as reflected by some very dramatic figures. As you say, 391 people were killed on the roads in the east of England last year. 23 of those were children. But this isn't just a campaign about speeding motorists. It's a campaign that aimed at all of us in the hope of making us aware of the potential pitfalls and hazards that there are on the roads. The fact that 50% of children who go out on their bikes don't wear safety helmets and the fact that almost 60% of children who were interviewed in a survey said that their parents were happy for them to go out on the roads, on their bikes, on their own. Now, I've been talking today to three women who've all suffered the loss of loved ones in road crashes and yet, despite their personal tragedy, they're all fully supporting this campaign in the hope of sparing the rest of us the sort of suffering that they've had to endure. Lynn Watson knows only too well the devastation caused by irresponsible driving. Fifteen years ago, her world was turned upside down, and not a day goes by without her thinking of her 21-year-old son, William, who was killed in a road crash. He was in a car that left the road at well near Norfolk and collided with a lorry. The car driver was jailed after admitting driving while unfit through drink or drugs. 
These pictures of William and his girlfriend were taken shortly before his death. His mother is now heavily involved in campaigns aimed at reducing the number of casualties on the roads. I hope they will make people more aware of what they're doing on the roads, of the consequences of breaking speed limits, of not putting your seat belt on. The consequences are for other road users, not just yourself, and they can be devastating. This is Road Safety Week and today the road safety charity Break was urging everyone to stop and imagine what tragedy can befall people like Lynn Watson. The ten children here represent the ten people in our region killed or seriously injured every day. The figures revealed by Break today are really quite dramatic. Of the 391 people killed on the east of England's roads last year, 23 were children. In a survey carried out on youngsters aged between 9 and 11, more than 50% of them said they were scared in cars because the driver goes too quickly. 94% of children own a bike, yet only 50% of them wear a safety helmet. And almost 60% of children say their parents allow them to cycle on the road on their own. Shirley Ling from Haverhill is another for whom tragedy has led her to campaign for road safety. She and her family moved from London to Suffolk to try and get over the pain of losing her daughter Gemma, killed in a road crash on the M1 four years ago. Four years now, and it's, it still comes back at anniversaries and birthdays and family times especially. Um, Gemma's missed, always missed, but we always try and include her as much as we can. But if this, doing this sort of thing will help another family from going through what we, we live through, even if not only one, then we feel what we do is worthwhile, you know. Liz Voisey told me how she's found comfort in trying to get the road safety message across. She also lost a daughter four years ago. 19-year-old Amy was killed on the A47 near Norwich. She was driving to work when she was struck from behind by a speeding van driver. You wouldn't walk across a, a, a field full of mines if there was a sign-up that said there's mines in the field because you know you're at risk. So why would you speed on the motorway because you're putting yourself and others at risk? Much as it helps them to be able to help others, nothing ever takes away the pain of losing a son or a daughter in such a needless way. Malcolm Robertson, Anglia News. Well, let's go back to you, Malcolm Robertson, at Army Hall now. Malcolm, this is clearly a campaign close to many people's hearts. Claire, I have to say it was a really humbling experience being in the company of those three mothers today. Clearly still very emotional about what happened, but it was almost as if their grieving process is helped by the fact that they're heavily involved in this campaign and helping others. And yet all of them said to me, please don't say in your report tonight that our loved ones died as the result of accidents. They died because of people's foolishness and people's carelessness. They died because of collisions and crashes. They weren't accidents, and they really wanted to be very clear about that. Malcolm, thank you very much indeed. You're watching Anglia tonight. It's 12 minutes past six. Well, still to come on the programme tonight, Amanda has the weather forecast for us. There's all the sports news and much more besides. Celebrating her loss, friends at Penny's Weight Watching Group raise a glass to their champion slimmer. And what's the link between Peterborough United Football Club and the jungle down under? Find out later in the programme. And I'll be here with the weather. It was a gorgeous day earlier in Thetford, although it was on the chilly side. But believe it or not, it's going to get slightly warmer tomorrow, although we have got some rain on the way. Join me at 6.25 for a full weather forecast. Well, some news in brief now. An investigation is underway after a woman was found dead after a fire at a flat in Suffolk. Fire crews were called to the ground floor apartment in Milden Hall shortly before three this morning. The 66-year-old woman's body was found in the kitchen. Police say the fire isn't thought to be suspicious, but a joint investigation is being carried out. Divers are continuing a sweep of the seabed near Mulberry Harbour off South End in the search for missing fisherman Colin Dolby. He's not been seen since his trawler, Louisa, ran into bad weather on Monday. Tonight, divers are trying to raise wreckage that's been found off the coast between South End and Shoebury Nest to determine whether it is the Louisa. 
Ipswich Town midfielder David Norris is to make a personal apology to the parents of two boys who died in a road crash caused by his former teammate Luke McCormick. On Saturday, Norris celebrated his goal against Blackpool with a gesture meant as a sign of support for his jailed ex-teammate. McCormick was driving home from Norris's wedding and was over the drink drive limit when he caused the crash in which Aaron and Ben Peake died. Hundreds of firefighters from across our region joined a national rally at Westminster today calling for greater safety measures. It comes as figures reveal that 22 firefighters were killed on duty in the last five years alone. Their union, the FBU, is calling for better safety guidance and training. Well, our political correspondent, Emma Hutchinson, joins us from Westminster now. Emma, there's a real strength of feeling amongst the firefighters, isn't there? Yes, there really is. As you say, hundreds of firefighters from across our region travel down here to Westminster today. The ones that I spoke to say that they feel so strongly about this issue because they believe that firefighter safety is being compromised. They say, look at the number of incidents they're called out to. That figure is going down. But then they say, look at the number of firefighter fatalities and serious injuries. That figure is going up. So what do they want the government to do about it? Well, they're calling for better training for firefighters, also national safety guidelines. They also say they need more cash from the government and that cash could be used to pay for more firefighters, more new recruits. The amount of money that is going into the fire service, both on the resilient side for, for national uh, terrorist incidents, etc., and also regional control rooms, which the Fire Brigade Union is, is opposes, we feel that could be better spent on frontline firefighters, frontline equipment, training and resources to ensure that we aren't losing our firefighters at, at incidents. So what's the government's response to the firefighters' campaign? Well, while the firefighters were lobbying outside Parliament, inside Parliament it was Prime Minister's question time and Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, was asked about this very issue. I'm sure the whole House will want to pay tribute to the work and the dedication of the fire services and the rescue services in our country and acknowledge our debt of gratitude to those who risk their lives and many who have lost their lives in service. They play a, a, a vital role in protecting our communities and I'm sure that uh, our ministerial colleagues will be happy to meet the delegation. The government also point out they do spend millions every year on the fire and rescue service and they also point out that there are thankfully still very few fatalities but of course every fatality to the firefighters who travelled down here today is a tragedy so they say they will keep campaigning to make their jobs safer. Thank you Emma. Drivers using the roads around a Norfolk hospital as a high-speed shortcut are being warned to slow down or face a hefty fine. Police have teamed up with the authorities at the James Paget Hospital at Galston. They say some motorists use the hospital roads as a rat run between a new residential area and Brazenose Avenue. As a result, police have been carrying out speed checks and advising motorists of the potential dangers. We do have a, a slight problem in, in this vicinity in that there's, there's two accesses either side of the hospital grounds through to, through to residential uh, estates and people are using it to shortcut the, the uh, traffic lights and that, that's where we get the, some of the concerns from. Sixteen soldiers from Colchester have been treated to a special VIP visit to Westminster today. The group from the 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, stopped for a quick photo in front of No. 10 Downing Street after a tour of the Houses of Parliament. The visit was arranged by Colchester MP Bob Russell. The soldiers say the public support has been fantastic. Obviously we're quite distinctive in our uniforms today, so um, basically people are coming up asking where we've just come back from and uh, basically expressing their support and Obviously, they're, they're sort of goodwill and, and thanks for what we've been doing, basically. Police have recovered two pigs stolen from a farm shop in Suffolk. Bramley and Pippin, both rare Cooney Cooney pigs, were rustled a few days ago from Gosling's farm shop in Trimley St Martin near Felixstowe. They were found after police received a tip-off from someone who saw the animals. Their owners, Nigel and Jane Smith, are overjoyed at having their pair of porkers back home. Young inmates at Norwich Prison have been making their own radio programme. Called Over the Wall, it explores their experiences of being inside. It's due to be broadcast on a community radio station later on in the year. Everyone making the show is between 18 and 21 years old, and the organisers hope it'll help them for the future. It's all about giving young people from hard-to-reach groups the chance to take part in positive activity and the chance to gain real skills that might help employability, raising confidence and just about giving them the tools to make positive decisions uh, in life. 
Now, here's an encouraging story for you. A mother of four from Essex has been named the Slimming World Woman of the Year for shedding half of her body weight after doctors feared for her life. Just 18 months ago, 45-year-old Penny Melly from Westcliff on Sea near South End weighed 20 stone. Now she weighs 9 stone, 10 pounds, and Alpha Patel has been along to meet her. <laughs> Stepping out of her past and into the future. This is the end of a long and emotional journey for 45-year-old Penny Melly. At her local slimming class in Westcliff on Sea today, she and others struggled to hold back tears. They had arranged a surprise party for her to celebrate her amazing achievement. For 20 years, Penny struggled with her weight, suffering from asthma, high blood pressure, and depression. It was partly down to the poignant words of her then six-year-old daughter, Holly, that prompted her to act. Um, she actually said to me when she was younger, when I was seriously ill, she said, Mummy, if you go to heaven, can I come with you? Which um, really did hit her. Holly is now 14. She says her mother's weight loss has completely transformed her. But she doesn't just sit on her night all day. She gets up and gets dressed and does stuff and that goes out every day. And she's always busy. At her heaviest, Penny was over 20 stone. To give you an idea of how heavy that is, I'm seven stone. That's effectively three of me. Um, pizzas, pork pie. We took Penny to a local supermarket to see how her attitude to food had changed. So, Penny, give me an idea of the sorts of foods you used to buy. It would have been things like sausage rolls, meat pies, um, pork pies, sausages, all high-fat foods, such as sausage rolls, everything that is really high in fat, easy to cook, like not a lot of um, preparation, but all the wrong foods. So, Penny, things have changed? They definitely have changed. What do you buy now? I would buy things along with the pastas, jacket potatoes and pulses, salads, stir-fries, fruits, um, healthy yogurts. All things like that, definitely like the high in fibre and proteins and goodness, but not in fat. As a result of the changes she's made, Penny's more active and able to spend time with her children. Her weight loss has earned her the title of Slimming World Woman of the Year, but she would argue it's her health and happiness that's given her the greatest gift. Alpha Patel, Anglia News, South End. Oh, good for Penny. I think I need to take note. You saw what I had for lunch today, didn't you? Yes, I did. <laughs> Let's just say the snack machine upstairs has made a good profit today. But it was just an <laughs> occasional lapse. Yes. You know, I've been pretty good lately. Actually, uh, Claire normally has sushi for her lunch, which is very healthy. So we are. Yeah, but today we were a bit heavy on the chocolate, <laughs> weren't we? <laughs> OK, we're here until uh, half past six. Then we'll hand you over to London for the ITV National News. <laughs> On tonight's evening news, the government orders a full review of child protection services in Haringey. The council accused of failing baby P, who died after being horribly abused. Economic gloom, unemployment jumps, and the Bank of England admits we are in a recession. Plus, bending the rules, Brussels lifts the ban on weird-looking fruit and veg. Join us for that in all the day's news at 6.30. Well, next, the man who helped Chelsea and Manchester City to find their billionaire owners is now being employed by Norwich City. The revelation came from joint majority shareholder Delia Smith at last night's annual general meeting. Shareholders were also told the club had never received an offer from billionaire Canaries fan Peter Cullum. Jim Rice reports. After 12 years, they're still the people in the Norwich City hot seat. But now the search for new owners is hotting up. Delia Smith and Michael Wynne-Jones are putting their trust in this man, former Football League chairman Keith Harris. His company, Seymour Pierce Investment Bank, brokered the deals which saw the Abu Dhabi group by Manchester City and Roman Abramovich take over at Chelsea. But right now, Mr Harris is struggling to find anyone to buy Everton or Newcastle United. So, what chance of a buyer for Norwich and when? His contacts in the game are probably second to none. Uh, if anyone's going to find investment from elsewhere outside of Norfolk, then it'll probably be him. In terms of timescales going forward, I wouldn't like to speculate. I don't necessarily want to see it sold to a millionaire or anything like that. I just want to see Norwich do well. The club needs to invest. It's very difficult because so many people are looking for investors in the Championship. Norfolk is out on a limb in terms of attracting the big investor. 
The board also revealed the truth about this summer's takeover talks involving billionaire Norwich fan Peter Cullum. It turns out he never made an offer for the club. So why wait until now to tell shareholders? Something that perhaps shouldn't have got out into the media, did get out into the media, but you can't then compromise the feelings and ambitions and ability to evaluate the football club by someone who may make an offer. Eventually, we now know, and Delia said so tonight, no offer was forthcoming. A rocky ride for Glenn Roder, who defended his decision to let Darren Huckabee leave for America in the summer. Coincidentally, Huckabee was named Major League Soccer's Newcomer of the Year yesterday for his impact on the San Jose earthquakes. As for the club Huckabee left behind, a billionaire buyout before the next AGM, well, that really would be earth-shattering. Jim Rice, Anglia News. Elsewhere in the world of football, Colchester have signed Crystal Palace teenager Lee Hills on a month's loan, while Norwich have signed one of their academy prospects on professional forms. Tom Adiemi featured on Anglia News as an academy student 18 months ago. Now 17, he's a regular in City's reserve side and has impressed Glen Roder enough to earn a two-and-a-half-year contract. Now, if you're someone who's not too keen on creepy crawlies and camping out under the stars, then spare a thought for ten celebrities who are tonight bracing themselves for four weeks of living in the jungle. It's that time again. Yes, we are, of course, talking about I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, and the new series, and that starts this weekend. Among the stars is a local woman from Cambridgeshire, Emma Baker has more. Well, it's that time of year again. Just as it's getting pretty chilly here, it's really starting to hot up down under in the jungle because it's almost the start of this year's I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And this year, one of the ten contestants is a local girl. Her name is Nicola McLean, a 25-year-old model and fiancé of Peterborough United footballer Tom Williams. Now she's swapping the glamour of her wag lifestyle for the creepy crawly delights of the jungle. As a self-confessed natural show-off, Nicola should be fine in front of the cameras. But how will she cope with a month of no makeup? I caught up with her footballer boyfriend to see how he thought she'd get on. I think she's going to be a great success. I really do. Um, she's really, really lively, bubbly character. Um, she'll get on with more people than she won't. But what about those bush tucker trials? Does our Nicola have what it takes? She's a tough girl, but, I mean, we've been on holiday a few times and she's definitely, definitely scared of heights. She's claustrophobic, she's scared of the dark, um, and she's not particularly fond of creepy coolies, so <laughs> it's going to be interesting a couple of weeks. She could be in for a tough time. Definitely, definitely. But, it's, you know, it'll be, uh, be fun viewing. I'm definitely going to enjoy watching it, so... She'll certainly have to deal with some strong characters. With the likes of MEP Robert Kilroy Silk and Esther Ranson, there's unlikely to be a dull moment. But let's go back to the Bush Telegraph Hut to find out if she'll have the local support. She's not going to like getting her hands dirty. <laughs> no, but if she's going to support Peter Barron people, she'll do her best, won't she? Yes, yeah, she will. She yeah. will, yes. Good luck with that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You always follow local people. Um, guy on the X Factor, so obviously high profile in the city. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? This could take all day. Sometimes you think that these people aren't going to cope and they end up by being really fantastic at it. But it, it, sometimes they have these sort of phobias, don't they? Perhaps it's spiders she doesn't like or toads or rats. There was one where there were rats crawling all over, wasn't there? Perhaps you'll... I should get one like that. Well, it looks like the local girl does have the local support she needs. Now all we have to do is wait and see how she copes when she hits that jungle. Emma Baker, Anglia News, in the Bush Telegraph Hut in Peterborough. And you can see how Nicola gets on in the first show of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, and that's on this Sunday at 9 o'clock right here on ITV1. You might have read about this in the paper. Stephen is leaving us and heading for Australia. You haven't been keeping Absolutely. this wrong. You're not going on I'm a celebrity, are you? No, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Well, I have to say, if I turn up in uh, Australia and I'm put in somewhere like that, all those creepy crawlies are coming straight home. <laughs> yeah, watch out for the big spiders. Here's the weather with Amanda Houston. <laughs> for a sunnier future, financial planning from Norwich and Peterborough. Sponsors of Anglia Weather. 
Good evening. Well, I hope you all made the most of today's weather as there's rain on the way for tomorrow and then it's cloudy on Friday. Let's take a look at the forecast rainfall then. We can see this band of rain moves in from the west through tomorrow morning, reaching our part of the country by the afternoon before it clears all of our region by late evening. So in the meantime, back to the rest of tonight and it's mostly dry with clear skies. So those temperatures could drop down to around one degree and if it does, we could see a touch of ground frost in places. Let's take a look at the sun times for tomorrow and it rises in Norwich at around quarter past seven and sets again at four o'clock in the evening. Weather-wise for Thursday it's not looking too bad to begin with, still on the chilly side but we'll see some nice bright sunny spells there as well. However as we get into the afternoon we lose the sun and that band of rain moves in bringing showers for most parts but the winds turn southwesterly which has an effect on the temperatures and we could see highs of around 13 degrees which is 55 Fahrenheit. So looking further ahead, and it's cloudy with the odd shower on Friday, becoming mostly dry on Saturday, but turning wet again on Sunday. And at the moment, it's looking brighter for Monday. So on to the summary then, and after a nice day today, it's turning cloudy and wet tomorrow, but becomes drier again on Friday. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Financial planning from the experts at Norwich and Peterborough. So a few early shifts to go, but that's it for our tonight, Friday, isn't it? Friday, my last day, but this is the very last one. So I'm going to miss you. It's been great fun. Mm -hmm. So from me, tonight. special good night. Good night. Tina 999, Parky 999, and you'll...